Hello, everybody. Good evening. I am so grateful that you all chose to join us this evening. We are very, very happy to present what I think is going to be a super interesting town hall to you tonight. I'm Assembly Member Laura Friedman. I represent the 44th District in Los Angeles. And we have a wonderful uh, two person panel tonight. And we're going to have a plenty of time, I think, to show you some really interesting information and also take your questions, which you're welcome to send to us uh, through the chat or through Facebook, and we'll do our best to answer those. Uh, today, we've partnered with Adobe Content Authenticity Initiative and the University of Southern California Center for Inclusive Democracy for a virtual town hall uh, to discuss deep fakes and their impact on our trust in democracy. We're going to discuss the challenges and the potential solutions to ensure transparency and authenticity as we adapt to a world with powerful and ever-changing technology. You know, this is something that a lot of us have been thinking about. You know, how do we know when we look at an image on social media or even in the news, mainstream media, whether it's true, whether the image has been doctored or changed and what we can trust, given how well a lot of the technology does with faking things. The Democratic Legislative Caucus has been thinking about this and taking it very seriously. We're trying to push back against deep fakes and have joined the Content Authenticity Initiative. And that was what spurred me to bring you this today because at the same time that technology is providing a lot of challenges and a lot raising a lot of concerns for, for many of us, they're also trying to help provide some solutions to these problems. And that's what we're going to explore today. Now, before we begin the town hall, I'm going to give you a very, very brief legislative update about some of the things that I'm working on this year in Sacramento. I have two bills this year that look to align California's transportation projects and the money that we spend large transportation dollars on with our climate goals and our greenhouse gas and equity and public health goals. So in other words, try to put less money into projects that increase road congestion and increase capacity for cars like highway widenings and put more money into mass transit, into rail, bus rapid transit and into active transportation. I'm working on a bill um, AB8 to strengthen protections for ticket buyers so that when you purchase a ticket to a live event, you'll have better transparency before you put something in the shopping cart to know what it's going to ultimately cost you to try to get junk fees out away from ticket sellers and to also give you the ability to know exactly where you're sitting in an audience before you pay for the tickets and to be able to transfer those tickets to other people if you can't attend. AB 496 will prohibit from California the sale of products, personal care products, so makeup, deodorants, shampoo, soaps that contain the most 26 most highly toxic chemicals that have been banned in the, in the EU. Believe it or not, the EU banned them because they're so carcinogenic, but we allow them for sale in the United States. So California is gonna take the lead with this bill and be the first state to ban those chemicals from use. Um, AB 810 will try to take a look at and help to solve some of the problems we've seen with predatory and unethical athletic coaches in the state. AB 1399 says that you as a human being can use telemedicine. When you go to see your doctor, you can say, hey, I don't feel well enough to go to the doctor. So I wanna jump on a Zoom and talk to my doctor. We're going to expand that ability for you to do the same thing with your pets, which you can't do by law. And no, your pet's not going to speak to a vet, but you can hopefully show a vet a symptom that a pet might have a rash, a wound. And if you choose, if you're unable, to go to the vet physically, this would give you the option if you want to do it through tele, uh, telemedicine with your vet. And then the last bill I wanna talk about, and we have many more, but I wanna to get to this topic, is to um, place greater restrictions on some of the most dangerous rodenticides. These are animals that, are, this is chemicals that are used to poison rats primarily that end up seeping into our ecosystems, poisoning our mountain lions, poisoning our raptors, our owls, and our hawks and poisoning our mountain lions. And when Pre-22 was autopsied a few weeks ago, he was found to have had a lot of these chemicals in his body, which is probably one of the reasons that he was very, very ill and acting you know, strangely. And we know we've all seen the famous photo of him with the terrible mange that was caused from him bleeding out internally from rodenticides. So I'm trying to do more to 
keep those out of our wild street, uh, out of our wildlife, away from them so that we don't inadvertently poison the animals around us. So those are just seven out of the 26 bills that I've introduced this session. Always um, happy to talk to any constituent or to go talk to any groups that you might have or organizations or homeowners associations about our legislation or anything in particular that you're interested in. And again, happy to have you here tonight. Now I'm going to move to our panelists. Our first panelist is Santiago Lyon of the Content Authenticity Initiative. And I'm going to let him introduce himself um, however he likes and to give you his presentation. Thanks so much, Santiago, for joining us tonight. Thank you very much, uh, Assembly Member, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Santiago Lyon. I uh, head up advocacy and education for the Content Authenticity Initiative, which is an Adobe-led cross-industry open source initiative trying to help address the problems of mis and disinformation. Uh, prior to this, I was vice president and director of photography for the Associated Press for almost 15 years, overseeing the global photo report from that esteemed news outlet. And before that, I was a photographer in the field for 20 years, uh, traveling around the world, and I spent a decade covering war and conflict. So the notion of authenticity and truth uh, runs very deep with me. I'm going to run through a short presentation about the Content Authenticity Initiative um, and uh, explain what we're doing and how it works uh, in hopefully understandable terms. So this initiative was founded in uh, late 2019 by Adobe, meant as an open source initiative, which is to say all the work that we're doing is available for anybody and everybody to use. And of course, will also be incorporated into some Adobe products. It was really driven by the perennial problem that we have, which is mis and disinformation, um, whether it's manipulated imagery, videos, still photographs, misleading news. It seems to be a plague and has sadly become part of our everyday lives. The other thing that in recent uh, weeks or months has been the, the advent of what we call generative artificial intelligence. So here I'm putting a prompt into a generative AI program called DALI. The prompt was Golden Gate Bridge on Fire. And now the computer is using millions and millions of images to generate some completely artificial images that purport to show the Golden Gate Bridge on Fire. Very dramatic. But three months ago, when you zoomed in on these images, you can see that they're very rudimentary. Uh, upon close inspection, they don't really hold up. And so last week, I put the same prompt into DALI, and these are the images I got. And this one in particular is very dramatic and would be quite believable if you saw it online someplace. But remember, it's completely artificial, completely generated by a computer. So the sort of perennial problem of mis and disinformation aggravated by the, by the advent of what we call generative AI, which is the ability to put in text prompts and get images like this, have really accelerated the work and brought a lot of attention to it. Um, our membership at the Content Authenticity Initiative started with just a few members back in 2019, and now we're at over a thousand members. On the left-hand side of the slide here, you can see some of the major media partners. So we have the likes of the Associated Press and the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Gannett newspaper chain, Getty Images, among many others. And on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see some of our major technology partners, both hardware and software, camera manufacturers, software manufacturers. And it's precisely the size and weight of this community that we think will allow this initiative to really make a difference. Now, when we started this, we examined the mis- and disinformation landscape. And we use those terms interchangeably, but they really mean two slightly different things. Misinformation is typically the unwitting sharing of misleading information. You share something by accident because you don't know where it came from and you assume it's true. Whereas disinformation is much more deliberate and is typically agenda driven and is, you know, the deliberate creation of misleading information. So the first area that we took a look at when surveying the landscape here was the area of detection. This involves uploading suspect digital files to programs that look for telltale signs of manipulation. 
The problem with it is that it's invariably a never ending arms race with the bad actors trying to stay one step ahead of the latest technology. And secondly, at least in its current form, it's not really scalable. It just takes too long to run images through detection software. So while it can be useful on an ad hoc basis for individual images when combined with fact checking teams, which are increasingly part of media companies organizations, we decided to park it and instead focus on three other areas. The first is policy, and our government relations team is advising lawmakers and policymakers around the country and around the world and keeping them abreast of the state of play. So we're working with local governments, regional governments, um, national governments, U.S. Senate, European Commission and others. And the goal here is to keep lawmakers and policymakers well informed of the status of the current technologies as well as what's coming around the corner. The next area that we're looking at is education. And here we're talking specifically about media literacy. And to that end, we're busy creating some educational materials for middle schoolers, high schoolers, and college students that we'll be releasing free of charge for anybody and everybody to use. And we think that's really important because the media landscape is increasingly confusing. And we think it's important that young people be educated about best practices things that they can do to help them navigate this increasingly treacherous and confusing media landscape. But what we're really focused on on the content authenticity initiative in addition to those areas is this notion of provenance. And so what do we mean by provenance? Essentially, the basic trustworthy facts about the origins of a piece of digital content, whether it's a still image, a video, an audio recording, or a document, where it came from, and what might have happened to it along its journey, and then displaying some or all of that information to the viewer to help them understand what they're looking at. And so with provenance, what we're really doing is proving what's real as opposed to detecting what's false. And we started our journey talking about creators and giving creators attribution for their work. Next, we briefly made a foray into the NFT world, the non-fungible token world, which was a thing a few months ago, but seems to have faded away. Now we're focused in on the news media and AI generated content. But when we look on the road ahead, we see uses for provenance technology around brand reputation, helping companies protect their brands around e-commerce, around the insurance industry, the auditing industry, law enforcement, for example, when digital pictures are entered as evidence in legal proceedings, how does the court know where they came from or what might've changed uh, since they'd been taken? medical and scientific imagery, satellite imagery. And so really we think that provenance as a concept is going to become something foundational for a great many things digital over the coming years. And when you think about it, every day we take great leaps of faith. We look at something, we believe it or not, but we don't really have any evidence to establish its veracity. Now, when we look into how this technology actually works, so we've divided the work up into four areas, starting with capture. Here, we're working with smartphone and camera manufacturers to integrate this content authenticity initiative technology into their devices at production, meaning in the not too distant future, when you go and buy a smartphone or a camera, it will likely come out of the box with this technology installed in it, and you as the user can choose whether or not you want to activate it. If you do activate it, what it does is establishes the provenance or the origins of the file from the moment the picture is made or the video is recorded or the audio file is recorded. And the way it does this is by securing metadata. Metadata is the information that's embedded into every digital file that contains useful descriptions about where the image came from, what the technical settings were, et cetera. And it's been around for a very long time. However, it's not particularly secure. It's easy to hack and it's easy to alter. And it's also not particularly visible. It often gets stripped off automatically by a variety of computer programs. So what we do here is we secure the metadata and we eventually make it visible. When we look into the next stage of a piece of content journey, which is typically editing, here we're integrating the technology into editing programs, both Adobe programs and non-Adobe programs, because this is an open source initiative. And here what happens is any changes that are made to a digital file in the editing process get captured as actions and added as additional layers of metadata or information that travels with the file. The next thing we look at is publishing. 
Unfortunately, nowadays, most publishers and publishing systems tend to strip the metadata from the file so that when you examine the file, the image, the video recording, the audio recording, you don't find the metadata because it's been removed. And the only thing you see is the caption that the publisher decided to add as a public facing piece of information. So what we're doing here is leaving the metadata intact. And the reason why we're interested in doing that is because then we're able to display some or all of it to the viewer to help them understand what it is they're looking at. And we call these layers of metadata content credentials, and they're visible at any point in a piece of content's journey. When we dig a little bit deeper, we can get detailed information around the creation, around the editing, around the publishing, around the sharing, and ultimately around the viewing. And so we're working with any number of media partners right now to implement this technology to help the public have a better understanding of what it is they're looking at. Now, the question is, well, how does this relate to AI or artificial intelligence? Or for example, Adobe got into the AI space. It was announced yesterday with an offering called Firefly, which is very similar to what I showed you at the beginning of this presentation, except Firefly is clearly labeled, the output from Firefly is clearly labeled as having been generated by a machine. And we're working with other generative AI providers to do that same thing. The other thing that we're doing is working with uh, technology to allow creators to label their content, do not train, so that if they don't want it to be used to train AI models, it would be excluded from those data training sets. Because some of the controversy right now is that some of these big players have been quite cavalier about scraping or collecting information from all over the internet and using it to train their AI systems without consulting with the copyright owners, without consulting the creators who made that work. And so here what we're doing is allowing uh, creators to label their stuff so that if they don't want it to be used in training sets, it will be excluded. And then lastly, I'm going to show you just a short uh, demonstration of what this looks like in Photoshop when I manipulate an image. So I start with an image of the pyramids in Egypt. I scroll down. I check to see if it has a content credential. That little eye indicates that it does. Now what I'm going to do is significantly manipulate this image. First, I'm going to mess around with the colors. Now I'm going to go into an AI function that exists in Photoshop called sky replacement. And I'm going to add some completely artificial clouds to the picture. These are computer generated clouds, but they look quite real. Now what I'm going to do is overlay another image on top of this image that I have ready here. And it's a picture that I'm going to grab here and I'm going to put on top of this image and it's a picture of snow. Now what I'm going to do is clear up the background a little bit. And then all of a sudden, I have a picture purporting to show the pyramids in a blizzard, completely artificial. I scroll down again, and I see the three elements, the original, the clouds, and the snow. Now what I'm going to do is export this. I'm going to add the content credentials to this image deliberately. And now I'm going to export it. And now it's popped up in a mocked up social media site. And my friend Andrew says, can you believe this? Pyramids in Antarctica. And so I click on the little eye, it takes me to the back end. I'm able to see the component parts of the image. And now with this little slider, I'm able to see what I started with and what I ended up with. And so it's a very transparent way of helping people understand what it is they're looking at and what might have been manipulated. And that, in essence, is the Content Authenticity Initiative. Amazing, really interesting. And I can barely use Photoshop, so. Uh, but I could hit that I button and see the history of it. So seeing that little, so the idea is that eventually you'll see that little button and then you'll know that you're, that the source is willing to have you look through the whole history from when the photo was first taken to prove that it was either real or altered in some way. Yeah, it works hand in glove with the sort of existing trust models. Like if you go to a media outlet that you trust, what it does is it buttress or strengthens uh, that trust relationship by giving you some cast iron guarantees that that image is actually from that source and what might have happened to it. But by itself, it's not a light switch or a turnkey solution. We think it really goes hand in glove with the other pillars that I mentioned at the beginning. 
media literacy is absolutely critical to educate people to look for this kind of thing once it becomes more common, more ubiquitous. And of course, the policy aspects of this are important as well, getting this into the classroom, working with the education departments on a you know state or regional, federal level, whatever the case might be. So we think that the, the combination of those three elements, provenance, media literacy, and policy combined with the detection software and the ad hoc fact checking that many media organizations are already doing. Those are really, in our view, the four pillars in the fight against mis and disinformation. Well, thank you. We're gonna come back to you for questions, both from me and also anyone who's watching. We do have a Q&A section um, on the Zoom. And I do encourage you, if you have any questions or comments to go ahead and use that Q&A and we'll, we'll get those questions asked. So our second panelist, and I'm so thrilled to have her, is Mindy Romero from the USC Center for an Inclusive Democracy to talk now at a, a different level, not about the technology per se, but about what all of this uh, fake, faking ability uh, in ordinary hands means for our society and our democracy. And thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Assemblymember Member Friedman, uh, for having me uh, with you this evening and um, Thank you to everyone that's watching and taking the time on an evening with your family and friends and so forth, right, to talk about this really important topic. Um, so just a quick introduction on me. I am, I am the director and founder of the Center for Inclusive Democracy. We are a uh, academic nonpartisan research center at the USC Price School of Public Policy. And we do, of course, as, the name are, as our name suggests, a lot of research around democracy-related issues, turnout, representation, trust, uh, in, in the election and electoral process and so forth. Um, but I will go ahead and jump in to uh, the conversation tonight. Let me share my screen. And oops, whatever reason, I'm not set on the, can you all see my screen, I hope? Yes. Great, okay, now I will go ahead and widen it out. Should be able to see my full screen. Perfect. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, of course, the impacts of misinformation, disinformation, and specific to our democratic process. Uh, the impacts are real uh, and they are significant. So that's the question for this evening. What is the impact? So, of course, Santiago already walked everyone through um, a definition of what is misinformation, what is disinformation, and the distinction between the two. And I'm going to add just something to the conversation here. So political disinformation, um, you know, can span a wide spectrum uh, from, let me just move these uh, images here so I can see a little bit better, forgive me, um, from stories that might seem quite credible, logical, um, from a source that um, you might think right, wouldn't engage in something um, that is not uh, correct or accurate, um, to something that is totally uh, totally unbelievable, far afield, but you know, maybe a scandal, maybe um, a criminal investigation that no one believes actually somebody's involved in, or you think no one believes someone is involved in it. Um, but because it is out there, uh, and depending just how real or you know believable the image are, images are, those fakes are. Um, many people, right, can think it even if it confounds right their sensibilities. They may. Uh, feel that they are forced to believe it um, and therefore act on it. Um, so as technology evolves, and I think Santiago also just gave a great example just in the last few months, which is quite scary, um, disinformation becomes more subtle, um, becomes more difficult to identify and define. But let me walk you through five key ways, main ways, that disinformation threatens democracy. Now, this is not a complete list. I want to emphasize that. Um, so one, democracies depend on informed citizens and residents, uh, their participation and expression of political opinions, their needs, their wants, their desires, right? For those for folks to represent us, right? We need to be an informed um, group of constituents, right? That are represented. And we need to be able to uh, make um, decisions that hopefully match our reality and our interests and needs about who to elect, what policies to support, what to abdicate for, what to argue for, what to protest for, whatever it might be. Um, democracies depend on informed citizens, as I said. It's the basis of those decision, decisions made by the citizens, right, that can be corrupted by disinformation. Um, 
Number two, it decreases trust in democratic institutions themselves, interferes with, and there's some overlap, of course, across these five things that I'm going to share, but interferes with electoral processes, fosters incivility, if you will, if you will and polarization. So democracy depends on the expression of political will um, to, uh, to have people that are representing your interests be elected to office and then to work together, right? To find hopefully common ground, to compromise, to trust uh, each other in the work that you're doing if you're, a, if you're an elected official, for instance, working in Congress. Um, but also it relies across residents and citizens, right? People that reside in the community across our state and our nation uh, to believe that we all have um, uh, legitimate, um, reasoned, um, uh, uh, thoughtful, right, um, uh, issues, concerns, and that our vote is, um, although we need to be very careful in our country, right, not to um, put a litmus test uh, against um, the right to vote or somebody to have to earn the right to vote, but there is an assumption that everyone that is engaged in the electoral process, certainly, and or the democratic process, um, is uh, understands and respects um, their fellow Americans' right to engage in that. So let me move on here. And I should note, of course, here, we've got a lot of uh, gridlock. We've had gridlock for a very long time. Um, it seems with increased polarization that gridlock uh, has only um, entrenched itself further, which of course um, can uh, be very uh, you know, discouraging to the average person. Um, but you know, at the same time, it right, also, um, is very much often uh, perpetuated um, or promoted for political gain. So using misinformation, disinformation as a tool um, to promote someone's access to power, their issues, their policies, and so forth that they want to see. Uh, number three, it can be a tool for foreign inter interference in politics. And the best example um, that I can give, the most common example I think cited, of course, is the 2016 election and the interference that's well documented by the Russian government. Number four, myths, disinformation comes from third parties. I want to note that. But um, as I touched on a moment ago, it can be promoted, generated by political leaders um, for their own political gain, for campaigns, uh, for political gain, but also sometimes just campaigns that are, you know, working in publishing, um, are political consultants, political advisors, um, the companies that create those flyers or those messages that go out to Americans that maybe are 10 different messages that go out to 10 different Americans. Um, and uh, because of that kind of, uh, we move from a broadcast world, right, um, to a, a multicast world, you can target very specific messages to some uh, potential voters or to some residents that might be in direct contrast to the messages that you send to other people, right, um, residents and potential voters, um, and use misinformation and maybe no one, right, no one else is there to, because it's not so broadcast for people to as easily um, try to break that down. Um, as again, as we've already stated, it's not an easy thing, period. But the narrow cast kind of world, multicast, narrow cast world that we have just facilitates that further, right? The use of all of our personal information, right? To create 170 demographic groups that then all get individual targeting. Um, and then, uh, of course, aspects, um, well, I should say the impact, right? From disinformation um, can just be in the levels of participation that we see. That, Levels, uh, the effect on the levels of participation can be significant and it can impact equitable representation, which I think is very important here that we just touch on here for a moment. So disinformation can enhance you know, social division, again, increased polarization as we've seen as of late. It can affect who's coming to the polls or however you vote, whatever method you vote. It can make people feel that their vote maybe is worthless. It can even among some Americans potentially um, depress their turnout, especially if they believe in things such as voter fraud or manipulation of their own vote as possible. Um, it also possibly could work the other way, right? Which is why we also will often see misinformation or disinformation uh, deployed to potentially rile up a base or a group that isn't doesn't vote as much or maybe votes but want, you know, a particular interest, want to see them vote more. And they, uh, galvanize them, increase their vote based on misinformation, right? That can be um, 
potentially uh, quite, quite powerful in motivating people. Um, there, you know, we know that also, um, let me just read this as well. We, I guess what I'll say here is that we know that people can feel, right, that their vote period is being obstructed, whether they actually engage in the election or not, or cast a ballot, um, that, that misinformation that is out there on issues that they care about when it comes to policy, when it comes to the worthiness of a candidate, when it comes to debates in Congress, whatever it might be, um, that ends up in and of itself, right, um, maybe, uh, damaging the playing field. So when we already have, of course, a, a, a democracy that is not representative, you know, we do not have a representative electorate. We have lots of disparities and turnout by age, race, ethnicity, and so forth. Um, we then see even those that are participating feeling like their vote doesn't matter as much because the, the conversations that are happening in the democratic, um, uh, uh, you know, landscape um, are ones that are completely not representative of the people that are actually um, uh, participating, right, or of the constituents. Now, let me show you this. This is just really quickly um, some political examples of uh, altered video. So there's unfortunately a number of videos for Nancy Pelosi that have been altered. Um, we'll show one here um, of Donald Trump, and you may um, recognize uh, the Saturday Night Live uh, spoof, if you will, of the presidential debate. Um, on the left is the real, um, uh, which of course is uh, Alec Baldwin, and on the right is the fake, which is in this case, um, the actual president of the United States at the time. Um, so how can impact, how can um, uh, uh, disinformation, excuse me, impact equitable, equitable participation? So some other things to think about here, different communities can get targeted in different ways and for different purposes. And this is kind of a, you know, uh, in the same vein of what I was saying about before in terms of narrow casting, right? So very intentionally targeting people to not just vote a certain way or to come out to participate in the election, but for lots of different reasons to stir fear, to stir hate, to stir division, to make them feel that there is an issue happening in the United States that isn't really happening, whatever it might be, right? And this, of course, is part of the playbook for um, Russia in the 2016 election, and we've seen it by other nations as well. So it can purposely and very, in a very precise way, uh, sow discord among groups, and it can then for also be used to suppress a population or group's participation, or as I said, also increase it. Um, widespread misinformation can lead to collective preferences that are far different from those that would exist if people were correctly informed on a wide divergence between groups, you know. Um, again, maybe we would have a certain set of, and we see this all the time, a certain set of policy um, uh, possibilities that are being discussed in the, in the landscape, whether it be Congress, whether it be local, whether it be state house. Um, and instead, those policy uh, possibilities, um, those proposed policies might look very different um, because of the influence of disinformation, right? Again, stoking um, concerns around issues that aren't really there, whatever it might be. So, if, uh, so for instance, uh, a really popular um, part of the Russian playbook is fueling concerns about racial and social justice issues in both liberal and conservative circles, platforms or pages, right? So putting out messages um, that something's happening um, uh, on these issues, but in different ways, right, that'll galvanize groups um, and stir up concerns. All right. Misinformation and disinformation can thrive during change or confusion. And this we see a lot in the electoral space, specifically under democracy. So changing voting laws. So in the United States, we're always, you know, there's always some sort of, you know, a change potential um, modification to an election code that we see across the country for various reasons, right? Or it's quite common, I should say. In, in California, we've seen a number of modifications over the last year, uh, new initiatives, new laws to open up access to voting. And other places around the country, an election reform, instead of opening up ac access might mean something different, maybe more like security or, or um, preventing voter fraud. Um, but whatever it is, there's always a conversation around, does this potential election um, reform, um, benefit one party or another. Um, but increasingly, there is a whole nother layer about just the appropriateness of these reforms being um, direct political manipulation, um, uh, a severe form of fraud, um, 
uh, something that is, you know, an overt stealing of, of, of a presidential election and so forth. So the level of kind of concern, the stakes have just been, have grown just quite ex, you know, exponentially, you know, from the pandemic and the increase in mail ballot access across many, many states because of health concerns around COVID to post-2020 and hundreds of jurisdictions across the U.S. proposing changes in their election code. And a lot of it fueled um by, by misinformation or a base that was concerned about misinformation or quite frankly, political operatives that were using misinformation to justify a change in an election code. And I'm not saying all changes in all election codes, of course, but we did see many, many examples of political operatives fueling using misinformation to fuel public support and justification around changes in election law in access to the ballot um, based on, right, um, again, you know, not accurate information. Um, all right, so I'm going to just quickly give you some uh, a snapshot of some research that I recently did with my colleagues um, at UC San Diego, Jennifer Goddard, Seth Hill, Thad Kauser, and Kenzie Lockhart. Um, and this is a study we were evaluating practitioner, meaning election official interventions to increase trust in elections. So because of everything I just mentioned and much more, um, if you're an election official in this country, in the state of California, and in every other state, you have had uh, a heck of a time the last few election cycles, um, just putting on an election, um, but also uh, being attacked, right? Uh, threatened your physical safety, your integrity, um, your resources stretched thin by public records requests of people thinking, for instance, people thinking that there is fraud and they're trying to, trying to um, determine it. Engaging in, of course, correct and appropriate uh, public inquiry, but also uh, having to field very severe um, interactions, uh, extreme interactions with the public that they've never had to feel before because of misinformation and all of the distress that comes from that or circles around that. So we wanted to know, we looked at a lot of things in the study, but just for tonight, we wanted to know were there messages that election officials were using, and we partnered with election officials in multiple states, were there messages that they were using that helped increase trust um, and helped people to believe that um, elections were fair and administered correctly? Um, and specifically, we looked at videos that were used. Um, so which type of informational videos made respondents more trusting, right? That voter fraud doesn't occur frequently, gives respondents more faith in their own state's elections, more faith in other states' elections, and makes respondents more trusting of just election officials, period. And again, I won't get into the details, but just to give you some example here, um, this is Colorado's, what we call treatments, um, because this was an experimental survey, um, but, you know, a, a, a direct plea from the Secretary of State uh, so based on personality, but also statue of office, stature of office, or just a nuts and bolts factual, you know, this is how the elections run, this is, you know, why there isn't fraud, this is how your ballot is secure, and so forth. And oh, this oh, one's the, I'm sorry, there we go. I actually didn't think the video would work, so I didn't plan to, when I tried to practice it, it didn't work. Um, and what we learned in the short is that Views on election integrity are not set in stone. We talk about being so entrenched in the United States, and we are in so many ways. And again, the impact of disinformation on that is quite significant. Um, but the videos that had the greatest impact in moving people um, were the videos that were just factual, uh, very um, not produced or very slick um, uh, just, you know, it, videos that included, you know, uh, shots of, uh, of the inside of an of a elections office and ballots being counted and how they're processed and all those sorts of nuts and bolts. Um, the ABCs, nuts and bolts, if you will, that actually had the biggest impact on people and moving some people, not everyone, but moving some people, we found it statistically significant. So election information campaigns work, but the type is important. Straightforward factual videos, as I said, were more persuasive than emotional or bipartisan appeals. And state governments and academics, we say, should engage, of course, in more of this research. Um, the bottom line is we need to be able to recognize and ignore. Ignore is a, is a light word here. Uh, challenge, push back, defend against disinformation. It's not a bad thing to be skeptical, period, right? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, period. We should all be skeptical of political news, especially during an election cycle. Um, but then to verify, right? Um, and so in this environment now, it's more important, of course, than ever to curate your news from many trusted sources to determine whether an article is actually news or opinion, which is very difficult to do, um, to track 
uh, the time that you spend um, doing that, the, the length of the article itself, um, you know, the reputation of the source, all of that sort of thing. And um, yeah, and then also to pay attention, as I say here, of your emotions, because if you feel your emotions are, are being stirred up, if you're feeling you're having a strong reaction, it might, I say might, um, be an indication that there's something in this content that isn't uh, independent, right, um, news media produced, um, that it is maybe partisan, that is maybe intended, right, to generate an emotion as, as in terms of, instead of maybe a factual kind of engage or transfer of information. So protecting yourself against disinformation can be hard and a lot of work, right? Bottom line, we've seen that today. And of course, you're getting tools from Santiago and Adobe uh, to help cut through um, some of that, um, but just to acknowledge that it is still remains incredibly difficult and it's not an easy task that we're asking of everyone. Um, thank you very much. And I will unshare if I can figure out how to unshare. Well, thank you so much. That's a lot of really interesting information. And I can tell by your presentation that we're kind of scratching the, the tip of the iceberg on the implications to voting, to our democracy, uh, to people's faith in the system. I thought it was very interesting when you were talking about a warning sign of something being uh, at least, if not fake, but at least not balanced is if you feel your emotions are being triggered. Um, and, and, you know, that was really interesting because at a, I think at an age where we are kind of at peak content, you know, when I was growing up, you had just a few TV channels and people were kind of stuck with watching whatever was on TV. And now we have so many different choices if we're trying to watch media, whether it's television or social media, that it seems like more and more the news channels are really trying to hook people by appealing to their emotions. But you also said that that could be a, a warning sign that something might not be balanced. I wonder if you could just briefly unpack that a little. And is, is that something that we should be paying more attention to? Uh, you know, is that the kind of thing that if you were doing a social media uh, or a media literacy program like Santiago was talking about, that you would teach people that when you feel that you're really being triggered, that maybe that's the time to take a step back? Is that sort of a warning sign? that you might be being manipulated at the same time? It can be, but I, I think as I remember, you were right on to note that so much of just what we think of as regular um, news, trusted you know, news content um, comes at us now uh, to, you know, in many ways uh, intentionally to generate some level of emotion, you know, even our local nightly news, right? Um, so it's it really hard for people to, to differentiate. Um, and, and, and maybe it's, best to take a wide um, a wide net with it. So we should be questioning our local media content, right? We should be questioning national news. Um, anytime you have that kind of feel that you're being pulled, is it the content of the story? Maybe it's, you know, it's a story that is heartbreaking, truly in and of itself on, on its facts, right? Um, uh, natural disasters that we've seen just recently, right? Um, at school shootings and things of that nature. Um, but uh, as much as if you start to feel that, at least engage in, in the mental exercise to, to see if you are being um, intentionally and, and, and um, inappropriately uh, manipulated emotionally to a level that's beyond just maybe trying to stir up a little bit of a rating. Uh, and I ask you looking across multiple sources to kind of see how it, one story, if, if I may, one story is presented across different sources can also be a trigger, right? And to let you understand if maybe the way you, you just watched it was not quite appropriate. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I'm glad you said that actually, because um, I was going to ask you about strategies and you just gave one of them, which is to verify by going to multiple sources and see if it's being covered differently in different sources. So that's really interesting. But it seems to me that there's really two different issues here. One is factual information that's being presented in a way that's slanting or uh, uh, not sort of presenting sides. The other is the issue of actual fakes and deep fakes. So yeah. I wanna ask you about the latter, which is, um, have you seen examples of actual fakes hitting the mainstream press? Can either of you, Santiago or Mindy, give examples where 
There were things that were patently false, either an image. I mean, news media is a different thing. I mean, obviously people can, a story might be incorrect, but have you seen images that were purposefully doctored in order to slant information or provoke an emotional response, hit the zeitgeist, either kind of going viral on social media or being picked up by the mainstream media? Can either of you give examples of that happening? Santiago? Uh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I think this is probably, you all are tracking all of this to great depth, I imagine. Yeah, I mean, you know, it really has a lot to do with the original source of the information and where it comes from. So when I was at the Associated Press, for example, there would be times when, you know, repressive regimes would uh, try and um, get certain images sort of through the filters of news agencies like the AP and Reuters and others. And on occasion, they would succeed. You know, they would provide images. I remember there was a case that came out of Iran uh, some years ago of uh, a series of missiles being launched. And at the AP, we managed to get a hold of the original image. And so we put that out and there were no issues. But the uh, Iranian government subsequently released a doctored image that instead of showing two missiles being fired, it showed five missiles being fired because they had photoshopped in additional missiles to make their military look more impressive or powerful or whatever their intent was. And some other news agencies didn't have access to the original. And so they were fooled and they had to eliminate those images from their services and alert their customers and their customers had to alert the general public. Uh, and something similar happened when uh, Osama bin Laden was killed. There were fake images purporting to show his bloodied body at the scene of the shooting, which were not real because those images were never released. And in some cases, those images made it sort of past the filters, as it were, which are often the news agencies, understanding that the news agencies are the wholesalers of the news information and underpin the whole information ecosystem to some degree. And their businesses licensing content to public facing media organizations who then get it in front of the public. So when those filters are bypassed by accident uh, or deliberately or whatever the case might be, you do get these images entering the mainstream. And then there has to be a recognition that when mistakes are made, uh, things need to be corrected for the record. And but sometimes the damage is already done. I mean, there have been studies that showed that, you know, negative or misleading information typically has a longer shelf life than um, positive information that might be misleading. And so it, it has a lot to do, I think, with journalistic ethics, with journalistic training, and it also has to do with the, this notion of context. You know, images absent context or a video absent context can be extraordinarily dangerous. And we see that happening all the time. People with agendas putting out imagery from different areas or different times and saying that it's to do with whatever the story of the day happens. So everybody needs to be alert and everybody needs to be take care. And I would say that everybody needs to be a discerning consumer of news. I think one of the issues, however, is that people feel they don't have time to do that or they prefer to have their own biases reinforced by news outlets that are more in line with their political point of view. So there's probably always going to be a subset of people who are happy to look at media on the extreme right or the extreme left because it reinforces their worldview. But I think there is a lot of opportunity, especially in the education of young people about how to navigate this uh, you know, media landscape and things that they can do, compare, contrast, very simple things that they can do, but that we seem to, as a society in many cases, have gotten out of the habit of doing. And I think that's something that we might be able to recover with the right level of effort and focus. I remember the doctored um, video of Nancy Pelosi with her shaking where they somehow were able to electronically like, you know, alter the, the image so it looked like there was something wrong with her um, by doctoring, I guess, using AI, the video. Uh, do you think that we should have a system to punish people or somehow, you know, certainly if you're trying to undermine a political opponent in the middle of a campaign, you know, what should happen? Uh, we have a question about that in the chat. And someone else asked, how do we ensure, try to hold media companies accountable without engaging in censorship? Um, do you have any thoughts about that? You know, it's complicated because media companies rely on trust. 
And so who do you trust? You know, you as individuals, we trust organizations that we have an affinity with or organizations, media organizations that we might have grown up with or media organizations that we believe are trustworthy. And so at the heart of it all is this notion of trust. But as we've seen throughout, you know, quite easy to damage that notion of trust through manipulated content. So how does one address that in this country um, bodies that can really hold media accountable? There can be law cases. We're seeing that now, for example, the Dominion voting systems case and Fox News. Uh, but those cases are often very difficult to prove because of the you know, First Amendment rights that we enjoy here uh, and all of those sorts of things. In other countries, they have bodies that, um, you know, overseeing bodies in the United Kingdom, for example, they have a press commission that looks into um, sort of abuse of media privilege and attempts to hold media organizations accountable with varying degrees of success, but they have a mechanism in place. And so, you know, once upon a time in, in the United States, we had what was called the Fairness Doctrine, which, um, you know, held broadcasters in particular responsible and made them give opposite sides of political arguments equal airtime in order to avoid bias. And then over time, that was, you know, eroded and that coincided with the advent of cable news, particularly Fox at that time. And we saw the dramatic polarization of what was once a much more, quote unquote, objective um, news broadcast, um, you know, uh, business, if you like, uh, reverting to much more polarized news, much more partisan news. And that's what we see today. I mean, you know, you can you can choose your news outlets according to their political bent. And if you're interested in extreme left or extreme right or something in the middle, you can find it. And so, you know, some people will say, well, that's the flavor of news I like. So that's the flavor of news I'm going to go after. And so it gets really complicated. But I think at a very basic level, this business of um, media literacy uh, in the education system is fundamentally important. And combining that with some tools like the ones that I showed that allow the viewer to understand the origins, the provenance of the content. So it's not about necessarily detecting what's false, but it's an effort to prove what's real. But, you know, it's increasingly complicated. And I think this generative AI technology that is really hit the mainstream right now. I mean, I was looking the other day, there were a bunch of images purporting to show Donald Trump being arrested on the streets of New York, wrestling with police on the run, running into a McDonald's, sitting in a McDonald's with his head in his hands, you know, stuff that looked like it was out of a Hollywood movie and clearly generated by AI, but very sophisticated and very, you know, if you didn't know and you weren't well informed, you could look at that and say, oh, my God, they've 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 taken this fellow and arrested him and he's on the run or whatever, when that's clearly not the case. And that's why I think we need to be more diligent than ever. And all of the things that we've been talking about here, I think, together might be able to or will be able to sort of stop um, uh, and, and, and get a little bit more control over this area. Really interesting. We are going to have to finish up, but I do want to ask another question and then to also ask each of you if you have anything else to say before we close. How much of what we see on social media do you think are doctored in some way that makes them untruthful? And I'm not talking about the things that we kind of know about, but ignore like the models and advertising who have been so heavily photoshopped that they they are making people think of a standard of beauty that doesn't exist in the world, real world. And we could talk a lot about the harm that that causes, but I mean, deliberate misinformation that's out there, um, either in the uh, press or on just on social media, you know, kind of whit large as we get, you know, as we go into sort of another campaign year, wondering if you have any thoughts about how much, how much should we, how cynical do we need to be? How much of this exists? Are there any studies? Uh, Mindy, do you, I'm not sure if you have any information around the, the percentage of, of media out there that could be considered manipulated? I don't, not percentage wise. And a, and a big part of that would be just how you define it, right? And track it. Um, but if you have anything, please. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think one of the things that happened is we've seen the confluence of traditional media and social media, um, which means that the consumer is bombarded by imagery of all different shapes and flavors. Some of it is recycled imagery from many years ago. Some of it is fresh imagery that may be real, but has been decontextualized. Some of it is clearly manipulated imagery. It's a real grab bag out there. I, it's hard to put a percentage on it, but I think it behooves everybody to stay alert and look for telltale signs and question things and don't assume that everything that you see is true. You know, once upon a time, seeing might, might have been believing. I think, you know, seeing now is more like, hmm, let me let me think about that. Let me look for some other sources to compare and contrast that. Um, but that requires a lot of effort. And unfortunately, a lot of people have gotten out of the habit of comparing and contrasting sources if they ever had that habit, um, which is why I think it's really important that we make a big effort to get people's sort of muscle memory, as it were, back to uh, a time when, you know, you were always asking yourself, where did this come from? What was the source? What agenda might that particular publisher have? Who is that particular publisher? And the good news is we have a lot of information at our disposal. You know, you see a news outlet that you're not familiar with, you can quickly Google it or look it up online and try and get some information about who's bankrolling it or what their agenda is or, you know, those kinds of things. But it is definitely going to require effort. And I, I fear that, uh, passivity is going to make things worse. I think that being actively engaged with comparing and contrasting one's new sources is absolutely fundamental. If I may, add, can I add one item there? I know we're getting getting to time. Um, so obviously, I agree with all of that. I think what I'll just point out, though, is of course, um, as I know Santiago knows, uh, the ability right to track and to identify and to be vigilant um, is not equal across everyone in every group, right? So uh, generally speaking, I think even though this is the information age, um, people are often low information. And there, there are some groups, age groups, race, ethnicity, communities that are more low information than others. And so it becomes even more of a, of a chore and more difficult for some groups to be able to to put that, that energy, the needed a level of energy and attention into finding out and figuring out, you know, what is real and what isn't real. And then when you couple that with the fact that there are many sources that, again, are purposely, intentionally targeting some groups over other groups, you have some kind of this compounding effect that can happen. So I think we just need to recognize that it's it's difficult for many, many people. And, and, and there's disparities in that level of kind of difficulty. And maybe lastly, I'll just say, I was thinking about the long-term impacts of this, right? And as we develop tools like, like Adobe has or other you know, um, workarounds, I'm still concerned as a political sociology, just the impact that this is having on our norms and what is acceptable behavior in the political sphere and in the democratic you know, uh, sphere, but just more broadly, the goalposts are being shifted. So even when you identify something as fake, right? A deep fake, whatever it might be, we still have been exposed to it. Something that would have been shocking maybe three years ago, five years ago, 10, just to see it. Um, or, you know, now we see it and maybe we see it really quite often. And even if we know it's fake eventually, um, it, still, it still impacts kind of what we think of as acceptable political behavior or what is acceptable to be in our political discourse. So I just want to note that too. Um, I don't know how we get around that. Well, I appreciate that. And I really appreciate both of you being here. There's so much of this topic that we could spend, you know, a whole career studying it, as I know you both have, and working on ways to counter it. But raising awareness is something that we, I think, desperately need to do with the population, because I do believe that it's leading to polarization. It's leading to people losing faith in whether there's any such thing as objective truth, which I do believe that there is, uh, certainly when it comes to an image or a, a fact. And, and the idea that we'll argue over basic facts that shouldn't be an argument because of uh, the misinformation that's being supported at a, at a very uh, sophisticated level is concerning. The, the fact that on social media, we see profiles on Twitter, for instance, that people that may have thousands of followers that we later find out are completely manufactured profiles. 
and they're not real human beings, then we are believing a voice um, is concerning. You know, the idea that people seem to think, and I, I have friends that have fallen into this of thinking that a, a CNN source is as trustworthy or as lack of has as little trustworthy as a completely unknown uh, source that they see on social media is very very concerning. So I, I I know that the more we talk about it as a community, the more that people pay attention and, and talk about it and think about it, the better off we all are. And you being here tonight and everybody who's participating and listening, being here is a little bit of a way we can push back on this problem. So thank you so much for your time. I wanna thank everybody who took the time to be with us here. Uh, thanks everybody and, and be safe. And I hope that this